Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Freilich, consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome to the neurophysiology puzzle number two. As with the previous and all future cases, these are hypothetical examples and do not represent live patients, as it were. We have a 47-year-old lady who is a right-handed business executive. She has a six-month history of tingling in the right little and ring fingers, as well as that border of the hand. And she's complaining of weakness of her grip. There's also some neck discomfort in here as well, and symptoms are present all the time, and it's not clear if and when it gets worse. On clinical examination, the appearance of the hand, there seems to be some wasting of the intrinsic hand muscles with some guttering in the hand, and the tone is normal. Power is four minus out of five, so there's some weakness there. And sensation showed reduced pinprick on the ulnar border to the wrist crease. Let's think about a differential diagnosis here. If we think about individual nerves, we could think about the median nerve and potentially carpal tunnel. Well, it's certainly not out of the question, but I would have expected it to affect the radial three and a half fingers rather than the little finger. And um, in addition to which, I wouldn't expect there to be wasting the intrinsic mus muscles of the hand. So this is unlikely. Let's think about the ulnar nerve here. Well, um, if it is the ulnar nerve, symptoms sound quite suggestive for that. We have this numbness in the little finger and we also have weakness of the intrinsic muscles of the hand too. So that would sound very much like an ulnar problem. Trouble is, is we've also got some neck problems too. Um, and so it's difficult to differentiate between the two just purely on clinical grounds per se. What about something a little bit higher up, maybe something in the brachial plexus? Well, it would be difficult to ascribe this to that because if, let's say, it was a lower trunk plexopathy, um, then we would expect there to be some numbness extending past the wrist crease um, into the medial aspect of the forearm. If it was a medial cord issue, then we would expect there to be uh, both median and ulnar involvement as well. Um, so that also doesn't really uh, fit with it. And of course, the clinical history doesn't really uh, fit with that picture either. What about a radiculopathy? Well, um, we certainly have got a history of neck discomfort here. And the reality is, is neck discomfort is very common in the general population, uh, which is actually why I've put this in as one of the clinical symptoms. Um, However, uh, when we think about the numbness, well, the numbness uh, is only in the little finger and going to the wrist crease. Um, it certainly wouldn't argue against it being a radiculopathy, maybe C7, C8 radiculopathy. Um, however, um, it certainly wouldn't necessarily preclude it. So um, difficult to know just off the bat exactly what we're dealing with, but the differential diagnosis here would be some kind of an ulnar neuropathy. And if it is an ulnar neuropathy, we need to think, is it a distal one at the wrist crease or is it one at the elbow um, or potentially a lower radiculopathy, C7, C8 levels. So let's have a look at the neurophysiology. So let me just introduce you to the word SNAP. Um, so this stands for sensory nerve action potential, and this refers to the sensory nerve responses. Let's have a look here. Um, so we've got a right median finger two response with an amplitude of 14 and a conduction of velocity of 56. If you haven't seen the normative data video, please do so now by clicking on the i-card above. But if you could just recall for the moment uh, my rules of five, um, for the sensory responses, so an ulnar sensory response at the age of 40 should be at least 5 microvolts, the median finger 2 should be at least 10 microvolts, and a radial should be at least 15 microvolts, and the velocity should all be above 50 meters per second. So if we look at that right median finger 2 response, so it's 14, so it's above number 10, which is good, and it's a good conduction velocity as well, so that would argue against this being a carpal tunnel lesion. If we have a look at the right ulnar sensory response from finger five, we can see that the amplitude here is just three microvolts and a conduction velocity of 48 meters per second. So three microvolts as an amplitude is small. Let's have a look at the contralateral side, which is asymptomatic here. And we can see on that side, it's actually 11 microvolts. So there's a clear diminution of the 
ulnar sensory response on the right side. Um, the left median response is 16 microvolts, uh, 57 meters per second, so very symmetrical to the right side. And um, on the left, we've already discussed, that's a very normal ulnar response. So uh, in summary from the sensory nerve action potentials, we can see clearly that there is a small amplitude of the finger five response. Let's have a look at the motor responses. We call these C-maps, which stands for compound muscle action potentials. So um, let's first have a look at the median um, velocities. We've got a DML, distal motor latency, of 3.3 milliseconds and 3.2 on the other side. Um, and those are very normal. We've got normal conduction velocities in the forearms of 50 meters per second plus. I say 54 on the right, 51 on the left. That's, that's fine. The... Uh, wrist um, stimulation um, showed an amplitude of 7.4 versus a 7.6. These are all perfectly normal healthy responses. Um, and there's no uh, blockage of the conduction uh, at the elbow. So we've got uh, a 7.2 and a 7.4 respectively. And the F latencies are fairly uh, respectable at 31 and 29 milliseconds. Let's have a look at the ulnar motor responses now. So the distal motor latencies are 2.3 and 2.2 milliseconds, so very symmetrical, very normal, uh, and we'd expect a distal motor latency of less than 3.5 milliseconds for the uh, ulnar um, motor response to the ADM muscle. And this is immediately beginning to argue from this being a distal ulnar neuropathy at the wrist, although uh, there are other tests that would have to be performed if we were considering this as a differential. If we have a look at the conduction velocity at the forearm, you've got 55 meters per second on the right and it's the same on the left. However, when we go around the elbow um, and we stimulate above the elbow and we measure to the above to below elbow segment, we can see that we've got 37 meters per second. So we've slowed down on the right side from 55 meters a second. And if you recall in the normative data video, um, we would expect the conduction velocity to increase the more proximal we go. And this is because the nerve is wider and it's warmer. And so it should increase in speed. So I would have thought it should be something like in the 60 range, uh, which is indeed the case on the left hand side. Um, however, here it's actually dropped down to 37 meters per second. So there is focal slowing of ulnar motor nerve fiber conduction across the elbow. We can also compare the motor amplitudes, the maps, the C-maps, and on the right side, these are reduced. It's 5.8 millivolts compared to 11 or so millivolts on the left-hand side. And when we stimulate above the elbow, it's only 2.4 millivolts, and so there's some conduction block over there too. If we also have a look at the F-wave latencies, um, we can see that on the right side, it's slow compared to the left. It's 36 milliseconds versus the 20. Nine. So what we can see from the CMAP studies, the motor velocities, is that there is focal slowing of the ulnar nerve across the elbow and there's prolongation of the F latency too. Now, if you recall, we also were talking about neck pain. Um, and so we proceed to do some EMG for that as well. And we can see that the EMG is normal for the biceps, triceps, brachioradialis and the EDC as well. And APB. However, in the IDIO, the first dorsal interosseous uh, muscles, we can see some active denervation there. We have a number of fibrillations, moderate evidence of denervation um, as well, and there's a reduced interference pattern to 5 millivolts, and so there's some good going denervation here localized to the IDIO muscle. So when we consider all of this, uh, we can actually say that it is unlikely for there to be a motor radiculopathy here, given that the C78 muscles tested by the uh, triceps and EDC um, are normal. APB, of course, covers C8T1, and that's also normal as well. So we just have focal um, problems here to the ulnar innervated muscle here, which we tested, which was the IDIO. So if we sum this all up, we've got a focal compressive mononeuropathy at the right elbow. And in conclusion, we've got a moderate 
right-sided ulnar neuropathy. Uh, we also can call this a cubital tunnel lesion as well. Uh, people like to call it by different names, ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, cubital tunnel lesions. Um, personally, I think it can be a little bit confusing for a busy clinician. If you present them with language which could be misinterpreted or misread as a carpal tunnel lesion, as a cubital tunnel lesion, it sounds pretty similar if you're in a busy clinic. Um, so I personally prefer the term ulnar neuropathy at the elbow and otherwise normal findings. Let's think about the neurophysiological severity scales for ulnar neuropathy at the elbow. I've called this one a moderate one. Um, it's not as advanced as it were in comparison to the literature for carpal tunnel lesions. And the most important neurophysiological grading is that of Padua. Um, interestingly, when we compare this to uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, where the sensory fibers are affected before the motor fibers, um, it's the opposite way around here with ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, because the motor fibers tend to be affected first, at least in the tests that we commonly perform. So in terms of the Padua grading system, to have minimal ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, one has to demonstrate conduction velocity slowing of less than 10 meters per second. So for example, if the forearm um, conduction velocity was, let's say, 54 meters per second, and it slowed down to, let's say, 48 meters per second, um, then that would be a minimal ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, assuming that the sensory response was still normal. Um, for it to be mild, then the conduction of velocity slowing would have to be greater than 10 meters per second, and in absolute terms, less than 50 meters per second. One always has to consider the relative slowing here. I think it's very important that. Um, and in terms of moderate um, impairment of the ulnar nerve at the elbow, uh, one would also have to show reduction of the sensory action potential, the sensory snap to below six microvolts. And for severe um, ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, um, one would have to have an absent sensory response as well as motor slowing at the elbow. In this slide, you can see some work that I uh, published together with one of my medical students, uh, Robin Brown, back in 2012, 2013, was presented at a BSCN conference um, looking at the natural history of ulnar neuropathy at the elbow and a trial of intervention for mild to moderate ulnar neuropathy uh, with an elbow splint. And we looked at symptoms as well. And we could often find that symptoms were really nonspecific. So hand wasting, uh, hand muscle wasting or hand weakness, uh, positive tinels, uh, actually quite difficult to differentiate from radiculopathy of C7, C8. And interestingly, uh, when we asked patients to draw out in their hands where they uh, were experiencing their symptoms, 44% uh, uh, drew very non-specific uh, diagrams. And so, um, you know, symptoms alone are not enough to make a diagnosis. So I think there's definitely a place for neurophysiological testing uh, to occur in unropathy at the elbow. And hopefully you found this video useful. If you have, please do support the channel by subscribing, liking and sharing. And I hope to see you in the next video soon.